I want to just bring a little bit of what, what was learned, what, the, what our students learned out there this morning, the rest of our time. So if you open your Bibles to Isaiah 61 with me, uh, let's dive in a little bit here. One of the most important things I think that we talked about last weekend uh, was the idea of learning to love the things that Jesus loves, that we would love him by learning to love the things that he loves, that we would practice learning the things that he loves. This works, I think, for, for relationships, for friendships, for marriage as well. We're, uh, Cheryl and I are coming up on 16 years of marriage, May 18th, uh, this, uh, this next couple weeks. And when we were first married, you go back 15 years, we were first married, there were some surprises, of course, when you merge life together. Maybe it was just Cheryl and I, you guys didn't have any surprises when you first got married. When we first got married, you know, there were some things that I wasn't aware that she loved so deeply that I needed to learn. Uh, I hadn't thought about sweeping the floor once in my life. <laughs> Potentially, uh, might be all the things my mother did for us uh, that I was never aware of. But, but I realized very quickly that Cheryl deeply loves a clean floor and that their broom in the closet wasn't just for Halloween. And so as, as, we, as, we, carry, <laughs> as we move through that year, uh, I realized that if I was to sweep the floor without her asking or mentioning or writing it down, that she felt quite loved by that, that I could love her by learning how to do that, by practicing that, by thinking about it. And over time, I'll tell you this, over time, I have grown to love a clean floor. She was really onto something with this, guys. <laughs> That I, she's away this weekend. I, before the kids were up, they had made a mess last night while I was preaching, and, uh, and I was sweeping myself this morning. True story. <laughs> True story. There, I mean, there were other things as well. Uh, you're going to bed at a reasonable hour, right? 10 o'clock always felt like there's hours left here. We're losing valuable video game hours. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, fast forward a few years, and if you catch me at a movie at 10.30 p.m., um, I am sleeping. My buddies will have to wake me up uh, in the credits. Um, they'll make fun of me for getting a coffee before the, before the movie and then also for falling asleep in the movie. And I am up at five, at the work at six. I love the mornings now. There's something about when you're trying to love somebody and align your life, your life with them that your heart, your mind starts shaping like theirs to the things that they love and that you yourself change. Right? I mean, there's a few other things. Eating chicken, didn't think that was, I hadn't thought about that either, right? Apparently, you don't have to eat beef every meat, every meal. I, I learned that early in marriage. And also, the last thing I'll say, just because it's kind of funny, is, uh, is I, we're not perfect. I haven't learned all these things. There's a few things we're still at odds about. One thing that Cheryl loves deeply is cleaning the entire house before we leave on a vacation. <laughs> I don't know if this conversation with you, uh, I haven't quite got there yet. I'm still practicing. I'm still trying to get there. It conflicts with something I love, which is leaving on time. <laughs> we're, trying to, we're trying to work that. You can pray for us. We're trying to work that, work that one out. As we grow in our following of Jesus, though, it's crucial that we identify things that he loves that maybe aren't natural for us, and we practice learning to love those things. As we do that, our hearts and our minds will shape more like Jesus and less like the world. This passage in Isaiah 61, we won't have time for the whole thing, don't worry, uh, but let me just give you a little context. Between the, the uh, chapter 55 and 66, the author of Isaiah is laying out the seeds that the Lord has given his people. The seeds of salvation, the seeds of righteousness, the seeds of praise. These seeds that will grow in their lives to display the Lord's splendor. And in Isaiah 61, he, st he all of a sudden writes this poem in three parts. And the author in the first part is speaking as the Messiah. So the prophet is speaking here, writing as the Messiah. And we can take these as words from Jesus. He says this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. The things that Jesus loves, good news to the poor, binding up, comforting the brokenhearted, freeing the prisoners. In verse 2, he sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. 
In verse three, to all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. I don't know if some of that language is recalling to you a song that the team led earlier called Graves into Gardens. But that song talks about the fact that God will turn our mourning into dancing, right? Here, it's talking about mourning into festive praise. I wonder if maybe conservative Christianity wouldn't have had such an issue with dancing if we had just simply called it festive praise instead. (laughs) We could have been born to festive praise. It's not as catchy as born to dance, but I think we should run run a little campaign called born to festive praise. He will give a crown of beauty for ashes. You can see this this image I grabbed off of the Youthquake merch designs where it shows that crown that the passage speaks of in black and white, but it shows this garden, this, this, this beautiful flowers springing forth, the roots going down and, and beco- coming out of nothing almost. I love what Pastor Alex said about the, that seed becoming uh, one seed going in and, and producing a hundred seeds and, and the seed and the, the, the amount of life that comes out of the planting, the work the farmers are doing right now. I think that we can draw some imagery to the fact the seeds spiritually that were planted last weekend, the seeds spiritually that have been planted in our lives as we learn how to live righteous lives that the Lord continues to grow those seeds into beautiful flowers in our life. It's the point of this passage. And this this part portion of the passage of the poem finishes up here. And if we jump to the next slide there, it's talking about the main theme in these first three verses is renewal for me, actually, as a person of God, renewal for you as a person of God, that God enables his people through these seeds of praise and salvation and righteousness. He, and he enables his people to live righteous lives. Let's talk about righteous lives for a second, shall we? Francis Chan explains righteousness this way. Righteousness is the life that God expects from us. Now that we have been born again and received his Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us to practice righteousness. It's not the type of life that's just given to us. It's not the type of life that just comes by showing up to the 9 a.m. service. It's the type of life that comes with practice. You guys are good at many things in your lives individually, and you have had to practice those things be them labor or athletic or business or strategic or education, whatever it might be in your life, you can remember the amount of work it took to get your primary talents and skills to a level of expertise and a level of passing grade or whatever it might be. That's the kind of practice idea that a life of righteousness should be viewed within that we need to live in practice, in growing, in nurturing these seeds that the Lord has planted in us. And the author is saying here that the Messiah has come to plant these seeds, enable us to live a life of righteousness. If you jump to the next slide, righteousness is the quality, if you get a bit more definition-like, righteousness is the quality of being right in the eyes of God, living right in the eyes of God, living Biblically, being someone who lives biblically. It has to do with our character, of course, our integrity, who we are on the inside, know what no one can see, the very fabric of our decision making. It has to do with our attitude towards God, towards others, towards life. It has to do with our behavior and how we treat people, how we treat ourselves, how what we do uh, when we're on our own. It has to do with our language and what we say. It has to do with our thinking and our thought life. Life of righteousness is simply living biblically, doing our best to en- enhance the quality of being right in the eyes of God. There are elements that all of us can work on there. But if we assume that the expectation is perfection or failure, that would be unbiblical, actually. Because it, it over and over again calls us 
to walk with the Lord, to learn with the Lord. The mercy and the forgiveness that comes from the Lord enables us to take two steps forward, acknowledge a step back, get right on the w- back on the wagon and take two steps forward again. And that w- as we practice living righteously over and over again, that it becomes second nature, that it becomes default, that it becomes something that we love to do. It becomes our sweeping in my life. It becomes something that where we understand, we wake up one day and realize, man, I really love the things that it says Jesus loves in here. And that's come out of a life focused on living righteously. If you jump to the next slide there, the third verse speaks about these oaks of righteousness. And I've been preaching from the NLT, but I like the way the NIV says it. NLT says they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. The NIV says they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. A planting of the Lord for his splendor. That you and I, followers of Jesus, would be called great oaks, oaks of righteousness. That we would be a planting of the Lord in our context. That we would grow in righteousness so that the splendor of the Lord could be seen through you and I. You see this tree. You guys are familiar with trees. This one here, if I go back here. Sorry, camera guy. This is a human. This is a grown human right here. This is a, looks like a Honda Civic, maybe 2004. This is a, a, colonial, a colonial build there. This tree is huge. When you type in great oaks, this is what comes up. This is what the author is trying to stir up as an image in our mind of you and I when we plant ourselves, when the Lord plants us and we practice righteousness and we live right in the eyes of God, that he grows us in the graveyard of this world. He pops up these oaks of righteousness that are on display for his splendor. That us simply living righteously would show his glory like this oak in that plain. It's an interesting concept to think about the fact that righteousness kind of works in this, these concentric circles. Or sorry, renewal through righteousness work in these concentric circles. That if I work on loving what Jesus loves in my life, that there's renewal for me. And that if I practice righteousness and keep getting better, actually, as the passage goes along, the next section talks about renewal through me how the Lord will work through his people to rebuild cities and to bring freedom to the captives and how his renewal actually flows through those oaks of righteousness. So it's not just actually about me being a large tree. It's about that that tree being seen and that actually through that, the circle around me, the people that I interact with are all of a sudden um, embracing or at least being impacted by the Lord's renewal in their lives as well. That all of us, it's not just for us, our lives aren't about us, right? But that as we serve the Lord, love the Lord, other people see that, that renewal comes through us, the Lord works through us and into the people around us, impacting our neighborhood, impacting our workplace, impacting our city. And then in the last few verses, in in the third part of this poem, he talks about the renewal of all things, that as each of those oaks of righteousness are living righteously, that the Lord actually is bringing forth the kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth, his coming kingdom, that it's bursting forth through people of righteousness like you and I. As we learn to love the things that Jesus loves, we live more righteous lives. That righteousness on display for people around us to see. They become renewed because they see the Lord through his faithful people. And through that, as it expands, the coming kingdom impacts this desolate world. It's a beautiful picture of the way God works to renew all things. And that passage also gets into the the, the now and the not yet, the new earth and the new kingdom. And there's a, I believe, there is a quote from my my buddy Chris Price that I want to read. I'm going to have to read it back this way. 
Chris Price, a, 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 a pastor in Vancouver, has done a bunch of writing, and this is a really helpful way for us to think about this passage in light of the way God is bringing renewal, not only just to me, not only just through me, but to all things in our world. He says this, because of the promise that God is making all things new, followers of Jesus are invited to live lives as a preview of that kingdom on display in the world. That because he's making all things new, we're invited to live our lives as a preview of that, of the earth to come, of the kingdom to come, of the way that he has designed us. Because in the new heavens and the new earth, there won't be tears. Followers of Jesus wipe away tears today, comforting those who mourn. That is the kingdom coming forth. That is elements, previews of the coming kingdom. Because of the new heavens, the new earth, there won't be any sickness. Followers of Jesus comfort the sick and bind up wounds today. Because in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no injustice. Followers of Jesus pursue justice and bring compassion to those who are subject to injustice today. When we get practical and ask, what are the things that Jesus loves that I can practice to make, make uh, in my life, become in love with those things myself, align myself with Jesus? Well, justice is near the top of the list. It is the one thing that in this passage gets right on the nose in verse 8. It says, for I, the Lord, love justice. (laughs) It's right, very, no, 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 uh, no confusing writing there. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make everlasting covenant with them. If God loves justice, his people should practice justice, should understand how to learn how to love fighting for justice for those who are feeling or are under the, under the pressure of injustice. The other thing I was thinking about when I was thinking about what Jesus loves this week is my mind was brought back to, to simply John 3.16 which, by the way, is a grown-up verse. It's not just a kid's verse, grown-up verse, right? For God so loved the world, he sent his only son. It doesn't say, so God so loved the Christian world, or God so loved the church world, or God so loved the suburban world, or God so loved the upper-middle-class Canadian world, the entire world. So for God so loved the whole world, maybe that's an indicator of things we can practice that we would be people trying to grow in our love for the whole world, for all the corners of society, and have eyes to see the injustice in corners of the society that we may not be a part of, that we might be able to use our abilities, our giftings, our influence to help fight injustice in those corners. That would be the kingdom coming forth too. That would be righteousness on display through the great oaks who are living righteously. If we go back to that, uh, that quote again, last two, because the new heavens, new earth, God and his people will be together, followers of Jesus invite all that would hear to come to Jesus, that we are actively calling people and inviting them into this kingdom. We are citizens of God's kingdom, the one that is coming and breaking in, and we are invited to participate with our lives, to live as citizens of the coming kingdom in the midst of the rubble of this world. If we are to live as oaks of righteousness, we must realize that that righteousness will be seen in contrast with the rubble around us in this world that it will feel much like a garden growing in the graveyard of this world. When we jump into, oh, actually here, we talked about justice, talked about John 3, 16. The other thing that I think is really helpful is I might throw this up every time I'm, I'm here, I don't know, but Galatians 5 just rolls us into the fruits of the Spirit. If we want a starting point for our life of righteousness, growing, nurturing the seeds that have been planted for us, then we can jump, throw that slide on. This, I think this is really helpful for us to think about. What does love look like in our lives? Are we practicing joy? Are we practicing peace? 
Are we practicing patience? Are we, are we prioritizing kindness? Are we manually in, uh, ensuring that we are living gently? Are we people of faithfulness, of goodness, of self-control? These things are fruits of the Spirit. These things are outworking, outworkings of the Lord in our lives. These things are what the seeds of righteousness, when watered properly, when practiced by his people, show up in the world. And these things also show people the coming kingdom, also show his splendor. And if living, if loving Jesus, go to, the, go to the next slide and we'll wrap up here. If loving Jesus by learning to love the things that he loves, if we are living that way, practicing those things, that leads us to living lives of righteousness. And through a life of righteousness, on the next slide, he brings forth beauty from our ashes. We all have ashes in our lives, something that's burned to the ground. Some of us have much more, it seems, than the person beside us. And yet each of us would have rubble in our lives that we are dealing with. And this passage comes to you to say that as we nurture the righteous living in our lives, he brings forth beauty, renewal for you. By focusing on what he, Jesus loves, we learn to live these lives of righteousness where beauty comes forth from the very ashes of our lives. And the passage has a few other imageries, right? The mourning and the dancing that we've talked about. The, gray, uh, the gardens out of graveyards. That we would be people that are, are, are focused on righteousness so that we would see these things grow in our lives and love the things that Jesus loves. The last verse of this chapter says in verse 11, the sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise him. His righteousness will be like a garden in the early spring with plants springing up everywhere. You and I are those plants. He will show his justice through us. He will bring praise to him through his people, through his oaks, through those living righteous lives. And what that leaves us with, I think, is are we willing to live those lives? Have we surrendered our own way? That next slide our own desires, our own will? Have we surrendered these into the hands of our Savior? Or are we still trying to live our lives as we want while subscribing to this Christian club? Have, have we shaped our lives to love the things that he loves? In what ways could we change that? Because when we do that, that is when we experience a move of the Holy Spirit within us like those students did last week. When we do that, when we shape our lives to love the things that Jesus loves, we start to see this world with an eternal lens. We start to see the gardens breaking forth in the midst of the graveyard of this world. And that changes everything. That puts us in a place to be these flowers, these plants springing up in the graveyard of this world. And that will bring glory to our Father and introduce people around us to the kingdom of heaven that they so desperately need, that they belong into, and that we can invite them into. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us in this way. Thank you for the seeds, Lord, the seeds of salvation and of righteousness and of praise in our lives. Thank you for enabling us to live lives of righteousness. Lord, we pray that you would bring to mind the ways in which we could love the things that you love. Bring to mind, Lord, the ways that we need to change, to practice, to work on, to develop so we might shape our hearts and minds to be more like yours so that we might be great oaks and that the people around us might be renewed through you because you're working through us. In your name I pray, amen.